Good morning. Good morning. I'll ask everybody to come in and get seated. We're going to start this morning off with Sing Amen. <clears throat> Sing Amen, Amen, rejoice, Amen, Amen. Glory be to God, Amen, Amen. Sing Amen, Amen, rejoice, Amen, Amen. Glory be to God, Amen, Amen. When the Lord shall come again, let the people sing, Amen, Amen. When the Lord shall come again, let the people sing, Amen, Amen. Sing, Amen, Amen. Sing, Amen, Amen. Let the people sing, Amen, Amen. Sing. Amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, let the people sing, amen, amen. We want to welcome you to our morning services today, and we have a few announcements this morning. VBS Decorating Day will be July 16th at 10 o'clock here at the building. Then VBS will be July 17th through the 20th from 6 p.m. to 8.15 p.m. <clears throat> then on July 24th will be our slideshow and camp service that e during the evening worship. Lou Satterfield has lung cancer and is awaiting biopsy to turn to determine type and treatment and she would appreciate prayers and cards today our guest speaker is joe kelly let's pray father we thank you for this day you've given us for the many blessings you bestow upon us and watch over us we ask you to be with Lou during this time and be with the doctors that will be treating her. We ask you to be with those that who cannot be here this morning and be with them. We ask you to bless this worship service. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, Ephesians 5. 19 and 20 says, speak to another, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God for the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And so uh, with our next song, I don't know where it's at, I'm not working. Uh, okay, there it is. Uh, so our next song is Sing and Be Happy, so let's uh, sing and be happy this morning as we worship the Lord. <clears throat> if the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in his promises, grand. Sing and be happy. Press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you. He will keep your soul. Let all be faithful. Look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Often we are troubled and tired, sick with sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. Take new courage, we cannot tell what the morrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then your heart truly can sing. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you, he 
will keep your soul. Let all be faithful. Look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by. There are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust Him each day, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and be happy, be happy. press on to the gold. Trust Him who made you His will. Sing your soul, let them be faithful, look to Jesus and Him and pray. Lift your voice and praise Him in songs. Sing and be happy
or are you grab one? Let's go together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for all the wonderful blessings that are in it. We thank you for the blessing that is that we get together here together in your name and then sharing our presence here with us. We ask that you be with us now as we take this bread which represents the broken body that was on the cross that, set, that can set us free from a life of sin. Please be with us now as we take it and let us do it in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for the blood that washes, our, that washes our sins away and that gives us a chance at eternal life with you. Please be with us now as we take this fruit of the vine, which represents that blood. Let us do it in a way that, um, that pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll invite the kids to come on up. I texted Jackson and asked him if he was doing the kids on our hours, and he just said yes back to me, so that I have it. So, there you go. Just please. Xander? No? All right. All right. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I may. this morning. <clears throat> Good to see you all. <clears throat> I thank your elders for allowing me to come and present the work of the, of the Philippines and to present you a lesson this morning. The Philippines is, uh, actually, uh, Mike asked me to uh, give a short presentation of the Philippines for those who were not able to make it to Bible class. So I got about, I think about 10 slides here. Philippines is on the other side of the world. If you uh, had a globe at home, put your finger on right about here where Muskogee is at, and then you start to turn the globe, you're going to get almost to exactly the side of the other world, uh, if that way. The actual side is almost uh, at the uh, Laos, uh, Thailand border there uh, of where uh, the actual opposite of us is, but uh, it's uh, a little over 9,000 miles over. When I uh, get on the plane at uh, L.A., I pick up the uh, Philippine Airlines, and it is from that point until we land is 15 hours, nonstop flight. That's the worst part of the whole trip right there. That is the most tiring part of it is it. And also, uh, just about the time we get halfway across the Pacific, the uh, pilot comes on and he makes a little bit of announcement. 
He says, if we have trouble, we've got no place to land. He says that if we have trouble, we will not turn back. Now, wouldn't that be a little bit shocking? Why would he say a thing like that? Well, if we're halfway there and we have trouble somehow, it's useless to turn around and fly back. We might as well just continue on. And so that's the reason we, we would just continue on to Manila. So that's the way it is. The Philippines here is, uh, believe it or not, there is over 7,000 islands in the Philippines. Uh, it is in, it lands on the ring of fire, uh, which underneath the Philippines and the many places is, that underneath on the bottom floor of the sea, there is active volcanoes, believe it or not. And as the volcano erupts and it builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up, and finally it breaks the surface of the water. Once it breaks the surface of the water, it becomes an island. Now, it may not be inhabitable, but it's an island. And so that's how the Philippines increases in, in numbers of islands. When I went over the first in 2007, uh, I looked it up and there was, there was 7,006, 7,006 islands in the islandry of the Philippines. Today, there is, uh, if you count them all, there is 7,124. So uh, in the number of years, uh, it has increased a little bit. So let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. My last trip was in uh, February and March of 2019. Uh, I visited 34 congregations in 19 days. Now, I handed out a, uh, well, it was handed out to you, a sheet like this. The, what you have there is the first, the first week of my itinerary, because I go for three weeks. And so there is two other sheets identical to this at, that I will, I, will, I will present the gospel uh, about uh, 34 times while I am there. Robert has me speaking every day at least twice, and every now and then he will, he will slip in another congregation on our way home, uh, which isn't unusual. Now, that, uh, those three weeks, we drove 1,611 miles into three different providences. A providence is much like one of our counties, and so that's, how you, that's the, uh, the similarity to it. And we were blessed with 46 baptisms in Christ. So we were very, very, very blessed and we're thankful that the, that the Lord did that. Now that is just the power of the gospel of Christ. It has nothing to do with me. I am presenting the gospel. And uh, I really believe that the reason that I have, uh, I've had the results that I do and this isn't a slap in your face, but this is just reality here in America. We are drowning in our blessings. We are drowning in what the Lord gives us. And the people in the rice lands of the Philippines, they are poor. They are dirt poor compared to us. I'm considered a millionaire when I go over there. They work, in the, uh, they, they work in the rice fields uh, 8, 10, 12 hours a day, and they'll bring home 10 to $15 a day. Think about that. How do you survive on that? The Philippines has 100,000, I mean 100 million, not 100,000, 100 million population, 120. Uh, thousand square miles. Oklahoma has four million. Missouri has six million in population. Oklahoma is about 70,000 square miles and Missouri is almost the same. Those three providences that I go and work in every year has about three million. Just about the, you know, not quite the population of Oklahoma. And they also, it's, it's an area of about 10,000 square miles, which is one-seventh the size of 
Oklahoma or Missouri. And I haven't even begun to cover those three areas that I go to. And I have visited within the last 12 years a little over 50 congregations. And I know that there's 50 more that I haven't visited. And the Lord's church there is growing, is growing by the leaps and bounds. And why? Because they have a need for God, and we don't seem to have that need for God. They like to hear about going to heaven, because it's some place that is so much better than what they have right now. You see, our problem is, brothers and sisters, is this. We don't need God until we have a crisis in our life. And then we ask God to fix that crisis. And what happens if God doesn't fix that crisis for us? We blame God. Because you see, we are just so blessed. We are so blessed from him. My results here of the Philippines and my trips, as you can see them there, my first trip over in 2007, I was blessed with 49 baptisms. I don't want you to look at uh, 2013 because I only had nine baptisms. I don't know what happened there because I teach the same gospel every year that I go. What I want you to look at, though, is 2016. I had 86 baptisms. No, I did not have them. It wasn't me. I was just presenting the power of our salvation, which is the gospel of Christ. And it touched the good hearts that were there. And hopefully today, as I present the gospel as well, it will present the good hearts here as well as also. So we were, I've been blessed so far with 458 baptisms. And because of your prayers and because of your support, those baptisms is accredited to you as well. So on the judgment day, when you are standing in front of the Lord and you're trying to justify your works here, well, maybe you will be trying to justify your lack of works. I hope that's none of us. The Lord will say, well, what have you done for me? And you can say, well, Father, we gave money to Brother Joe, and he went to the Philippines, and he had this many baptisms. And he says, that's going to be accredited to us. So the good Lord opens up the book of life, and he says, yeah. Mr. Mike Daniels, yeah, I, yeah, you helped him with 46 baptisms in 2019. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in to your heavenly rest. And I hope we all will hear that from our Lord Jesus on that day. Here's a, here's a picture of uh, one of the lessons I present. Who is Jesus? You see, there in Matthew, that, that, that question was asked, of Peter. And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The next one there in Luke chapter 22, Jesus was taken to the Sanhedrin and he was interrogated by the Sanhedrin. And they really couldn't get too far with him, and so they just asked him, Are you the Son of God? And virtually he said, Yes, I am. I am the Son of God. And then he, later on in John 3, he went to see his cousin, John, called John the Baptist. He went to see him because he needed to be, he needed to be baptized, not because he had sins, no, but because he needed to fulfill the law, you see. And so he asked John to baptize him, and John says, I need to be baptized of you. But he did. He baptized our Lord Jesus and what took place. The Holy Spirit, in like this form of a dove, came down and landed upon him. And the voice from the heaven said, Behold, this is my beloved Son, who I am and well pleased. So see, we have there three different testimonies of who Jesus was, the Son of God. And isn't it amazing that the Almighty God of heaven testified as well? And we have people today who openly deny it. So one of our baptisms that we have there is, uh, I see you have a nice baptistry here. 
Well, they have a baptistry wherever they can find water. Sometimes we don't have water close, so like here, we go to the uh, irrigation pump house, and we take a 55-gallon plastic drum with us, and we baptize someone in there. Or we'll go to an irrigation ditch, and we'll baptize there. Or to the river, and we'll baptize someone there. So see, it's not a particular place. If we didn't have this and we had someone come forward today, we could go and find water somewhere here. We don't need a lot of water, just enough to totally submerge one, totally immerse one, totally bury one in water. But it's not the water that is having the power of God. What has the power of God for our salvation? It is the gospel of Christ. But what did Jesus shed on the day that he was crucified? The blood of Jesus is what washes our sins away. Now I have here in the front of my Bible, I'll just pull it out and show it to you. You can't see it, but on here is a scripture list of 22 verses that says that we are saved in some way. Do you realize that? We are saved by the love of God. We are saved by the love of Christ. We are saved by God's mercy, by God's grace, by the death of Christ, by the resurrection of Christ, by the blood of Christ, by the life of Christ, by the gospel. By preaching the gospel, we're saved by that. We're saved by our works. We're saved by hope, by hearing the word of God. We're saved by faith. We're saved by obedience. And we're saved by baptism and so forth. You see, there's no need to take just one passage out of God's word and build your salvation around it. That's not the way God taught us. Here again, I am baptizing this gentleman right here in water. He will be immersed and he will have sins on his soul. And he will be resurrected out of that baptistry of water and he will be For the second time, he will be sinless. Do you realize that? When you came forth from your mother's womb, you were a sinless child of God. You were sinless until you became knowledgeable of right and wrong and committed sin against God. And then you were no longer sinless. And then you were sinful. You were rebellious against God until the day that you accepted your Lord Jesus, and were baptized. And then when you came up out of that burial of water again, you were sinless again for the second time in your life. And how many of us are sinless today? Yes. Come on. Come on. If you are baptized into Christ and if you are a faithful child of God, you are sinless. How do we know that? Well, 1 John 1 says that the blood of Christ continually washes us and cleanses us, doesn't it? No, we aren't really sinless, but in the eyes of God we are, you see. Okay. So let's change the screen now and let's just go on forward to, let's go again. I'm going to show you one more picture here. Oh, right, I got to show you this. This was in 2012. I was at I was at the congregation, at the Santar congregation, and I thought we had a lot of babies that day, that Sunday. And so I asked Evelyn, I said, Evelyn, after, after services, would you get all the mothers uh, uh, with their young children, the ones that's one year or older, and let's get a picture of them? And I was shocked. We had 28. 28. They had a good crop that year, didn't they? A good crop that year, 28. <clears throat> and, 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 and that's why, yeah, hold, hold this picture right here. But anyway, at 28, that's why we send funds over to buy vitamins, to buy medicine, and to buy baby formula for these mothers and these, and these young children. So that is something that uh, not as a congregation, but as individual, if you wanted to do that, I have, a, I, have a, I have a sister in Christ who's retired, and she is from Dale, Oklahoma. 
and she sends me $25 to $50 every month. She says, Joe, she says, I will send it to you at the end of the month because what I have left over, I'm going to give to you because I want you to send that over and help the children. And so I do that, and uh, she, has, she has purchased a truckload of vitamins and medicine and baby formula in the past, uh, about the past eight years that she's been doing this. This young lady here is Miss Althea. Now, Miss Althea in 2013 was born. Her mother and father, Brother Louie, he's a, he's, a, he's a preacher, and her mother, Mary Ann, they came to me while I was there that year and asked me, he says, would you help us? Or she, she said, would you help me with my delivery? And I said, how can I do that, Mary Ann? Because uh, she wasn't due to, to, to deliver for about another month or another 45 days. But she says, I don't want a midwife coming to the house. She says, I want to go to a birthing center. I said, that makes sense. I said, well, what can I do? And she says, we need funds because it's going to cost us and we don't have the money. And I said, how much does it cost? She says, about $80. Good grief, is that all? So I gave him 120 <laughs> I said, now that will pay for the birthing center and then for anything else that you need afterwards for that, for that young baby, uh, you get it. And I said, if you need more, you just have uh, Louie give me a text. Well, anyway, she had a healthy child. Right here she is. And her name is Althea. Well, what is so special about this, about this child? Uh, let's turn the, uh, the screen to one here. Here we are now. Althea. Kelly Sadal. They named the little girl's middle name after me. That's why she's so special. So see, see, here she is. She is six years old. Today she's going on nine or ten. I'm not sure when her birthday really is. I think it was, actually, I think it was last month in June. But I'm hoping to see her again uh, if I'm able to go next year. So that's just one of the many blessings that I have received uh, from Big Ebbly going over there to them. Oh, yes, there is uh, Maria's house caught on fire, and she could not replace it. And so uh, we gave her, uh, we had a, a carpenter come and talk with us, and he said, I can uh, rebuild her house for about $600. So we gave them $600, and they rebuilt her house for that. So let's go on to the slide, and I'll present the lesson there. Uh, again, <coughs> turn it one more time. Here we are. I have a question for you today, and turn it again. Why are you here? Why are you here today? For there's many reasons why we're here. We're here to worship our Almighty God, are we not? We're here to remember the death of our Lord Jesus. We're here to remember those six hours that he hung on the cross for you and me. We are here to remember the blessings that God gives us on a daily basis. You see, and these are all correct, but let's put those all together and let's boil them down to one human element. Why are we here, brothers and sisters? We're here because we want to go to heaven. Now, I may be wrong, but when we boil it all down, what did, what was said to us? What did Paul say? Well, it wasn't Paul, it was Peter, I'm sorry. It was Peter. In Acts chapter 2, at the end of chapter 2, he said, save yourselves. What? Save yourselves. How do I save myself? Do I must do a lot of works? No. Well, we're going to find out what it is. What I am here for. We need to, we, we have uh, different keys around the house. We have the key for our truck, a key for our car. The ladies may have a key to the jewelry box. You men, you may have a key to your locker at work, you see. What about your key to heaven. Where's my truck key? 
right here. You know, a key to heaven would be something that you would want to keep on your keychain, wouldn't it? So you would have it all the time. I got four keys here. None of them fits the heaven's door. I wonder where that key is, what that key is. So we'll find out. Here in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now see, that Lord, Lord is really meaning that one is submitting their will to his will. I bow down to you, Lord. You see, that's what that means. But the one who enters, I mean the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. What does he have to do? He has to do the Lord's will before he can enter heaven. So what is the key to going to heaven? According to this verse, it is doing God's will. See, Jesus said, made the statement, he says, if you love me, in John 14 and 15, that little too little word, if. See, this is a statement question or it's a question statement, ever how you look at it. If you love me. How many of us love Jesus this morning? Raise your hand. Oh, thank you. Very good. I'm glad that you, you raise your hands because that, well, you're telling me and you're telling others that you're not ashamed of him, you see. Yes, if, if you love me, you will, do, you, you will keep my commandments. Why? Well, because of what he has done for us. Again, it's those six hours on the cross. Can you imagine six hours on the cross? It is 1050. According to, the, according to the scriptures, Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning. If it was this morning, he'd still be on the cross. He was on the cross at 9 o'clock this morning. He will be on the cross when we depart from here, won't he? When you go home to eat or you go out to eat and you're enjoying that food and fellowship, friendship with someone, he's still hanging on the cross for you. When you pick up your plates at home and take them to the kitchen, put them in the sink, or when you're at the restaurant and you depart about 1 or 1 30, he's still hanging on the cross for you. I don't know what you do on Sunday afternoon. Sometimes I know some people that take a little nap. Well, this time of the year, NASCAR is racing, and so I always turn NASCAR on. And I'll watch it for a few hours. Jesus is still hanging on the cross. For you. For me. How often do we think about that? six hour time period in our lives that's why we love Jesus that's why we submit ourselves to him and the word of God Luke says it this way in Luke 6 he says now why do you call me Lord Lord and do not do what I ask or do not do what I say See, when you were being raised by your parents, sometimes your parents had to get on to you. I thought I told you to do this, or I thought I told you not to do that. Why do you disobey me? Jesus is asking us the same thing. Why do you not do what I say? Why do you not do what I ask? You see. Next. Here in Acts 5, we have this scene, and it says, But someone came and reported to them, The men who you put in, in, in prison yesterday, the men who you put in prison is standing in the temple area and is teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without the violence, because they were afraid of the people of being stoned, it says. And then verse 27 
When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council and the high priest for integration. That was a Sanhedrin that they were standing in front of. He said, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in, in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with all your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. How dare you do something like that? How dare you disobey us? This morning in class, I reminded a man in the class, remember when Dr. Fauci said, you can no longer shake hands, you can no longer hug how many of us obeyed him? You know, he actually told the French people you can no longer kiss. <laughs> Boy, what an overreach of authority they have. Even our government, even at one point, tried to tell us that we couldn't come and gather to worship our Lord Jesus, couldn't it? Didn't they? What a shame. What a shame. But then verse 29, it says, But Peter and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than men. And I hope that we, too, have the same attitude. So let's go to the next one. Here in, um, here in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, the Apostle Paul has this to say. He says, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, when you received it, when you took it into your heart, so to speak, which you heard from us and you accepted. That means you accepted, you believed it. You believed it and you acted upon it. That it wasn't the word of men, but it was really the word of God, which is also working within you who, who believe, you see. So what is this word of God that Paul was talking about? Well, it's what Paul also was talking about in Romans 1.16. When Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, or for salvation, you see. So that word of God that was presented to them was the gospel. The word of God that they believed in was the gospel of Christ. Do you know that the gospel of Christ is a specific power? God has many powers. Genesis 1.1 1, 1 and it says that God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do that? God just simply spoke it, didn't he? He spoke it, and earth was there. That's power that we cannot, we cannot really deal with, because it, it is outside of our five senses. Anything that's outside of our five senses, we have a, we have a hard time grasping. Well, that's one thing that is difficult for us. It's just like the power of God and the size of the universe. For a minute, let's say you're on a spaceship and you fire off from Earth. We are in the Milky Way galaxy, are we not? The Milky Way galaxy. We cannot even get from one end to the other in a hundred years even if we're going at the speed of light. You know how long it takes the speed of light to get from the sun to the earth? Eight minutes and 13 seconds. Our scientists, computer-wise, they say that it would take over 200 years at the speed of light to go from one end to the other end of the Milky Way galaxy. That's quite a distance. But that's really terribly small. Because when you're out at night and you're looking up at the clear sky, you're seeing just a very small picture of our, galley, of our galaxy. Only maybe a three-inch diameter. That's not very big, you see. But the rest of the galaxy is not the rest of the galaxy because there is a beginning and an ending to it. But the rest of God's galaxies out there, because there's hundreds of galaxies out there, is endless. You're on your spaceship and you're going, you have now left the Milky Way galaxy and you're flying over to the next galaxy. Then the next galaxy. And then the next galaxy. And then the next galaxy. Where does, it, where does God's universe end? 
You see, we have a beginning and an ending. God does not. God's creation, his, his universe is endless. That goes beyond our five senses, and so we have a difficult time understanding that. Now, Paul says in Romans 13, he says, Every person is subject to the governing authorities, just like every member here is subject to the elders' authorities, you see. And where does their authority come from? Their authority comes from God's word. Do they have authority to make up changes to God's word? No, they do not. But they do have the authority to direct what is in God's word to the Lord's church here. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. I don't know whether, where you are politically, but it kind of bothers me that God put uh, Mr. Biden as president of the United States. Because he is in authority. So therefore, the scripture says, and the scriptures is not lying to us, that our, our God put him there for a reason. Now then, in Ephesians 6, 1, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that you may turn out well for you, and that you may live long on earth. So you want to have long years on earth? Obey your parents. Honor them, you see. Now this says children, doesn't it? Are we not all children of our parents? Yes, we are. Are we not all children of God? Yes, we are. So who are we to obey? We are to obey our parents. That was actually speaking of our earthly parents. But we can take it and apply it to our spirituality as well. We are to obey our Heavenly Father, are we not? Yes, we are. Now, in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, um, 6 2, it says, Behold now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Friends, that doesn't mean tomorrow. When does tomorrow come? It comes tomorrow, doesn't it? You know something? Tomorrow never comes. Never comes. So what do we have? We have today, do we not? That is what we have control of, is today. The here and now, right now, today. Are you as faithful to your Lord and God as you know you should be? Are you as faithful to your Lord and God as you know you can be? Can be. Because see, you can be more faithful. Each one of us can be more faithful. And we need to be. Why? Why? Because the scriptures in Romans 3 and 23 says we all have sinned. Now, we don't want to talk about that, do we? We don't want to admit that we are rebellious against God from time to time. Sometimes we don't mean to be. And other times we do mean to be. And that's why we need the love of God, you see. That's why Jesus hung on that cross for six hours that we talked about here earlier. See, in Hebrews 5 and 9, it says, And having been perfected, well, I thought Jesus was sinless, so how do you perfect a sinless, perfect person? Well, what this was referring to was, you know, Jesus was sent to earth to do his Father's will, wasn't he? And did he accomplish his Father's will? Yes, he did. 
He did. On the cross, it was one of the, one of the seven sayings on the cross. Thy will has been done, Father, you see. All has been done. I am now ready to deliver my spirit unto you, Father, you see. So he became the source of our salvation, the source of eternal salvation to all those who believe. How do we get that source of salvation? What do we have to do to get that source of salvation? Well, what does it say here? Those who obey him. See, obedience is required to receive what? Our eternal salvation, our heavenly home. See, the brother Paul speaks of it a little bit differently in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 7. To give relief to you who are afflicted along with us when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Dealing out retribution. That is a little scary to me. Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. What was my question this morning? What are you doing here? And you want to go to heaven. And then we talked about some keys, didn't we? What is the key for us to getting into heaven? I've talked about it. Have I made an impression on you yet? Someone tell me what that key is. A little louder. Obedience. That is our key to heaven. When Peter said, save yourselves to those Jews in Acts chapter 2, what was he referring to? He was referring to accepting the gospel of Christ. He was accepting, he was speaking of us, making our submission to God. Not my will, Father, but your be done. Let's do something here the old-fashioned way. Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. And let's just read that together. And let's understand what was done and what was asked. And let's start in verse 30. uh, No, let's start in verse 36. And therefore all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. No, we were not there when when he was crucified So we did not have a part in it, did we? Oh, but yes, we did, because we have been been disobedient to him. We've been rebellious towards him. That's why we have sinned, you see. In verse 37, And now, when they heard this, they were pierced to their heart, said to Peter and to the rest of his apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Why did they ask that? Did they not already believe that Jesus was the Son of God? See, that's what pierced their hearts, was that they were were made to see that they had crucified the Messiah who they had been looking for for hundreds of years. And so they realized, and they realized that that their souls was in jeopardy. So they said, what must we do? And Peter simply gave them the key to heaven. He said in verse 38, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Not because of your sins have already been forgiven, but because your sins has not yet been forgiven. But I am offering you that salvation, you see. Then in Acts chapter 22, where Saul was on the road to Damascus, and the Lord appeared to him, and he asked him the same thing. What must I do? And Jesus told him to go into Damascus. 
Why didn't Jesus tell him what he must do to be, to be saved? Because God never does what man can do or what man should do. That's called evangelism. We ought to share the word of God with others. So Saul was taken on into Damascus because he was blind at that time. And then God sent to him Ananias to present the gospel to him. You know, but I think Saul knew a little bit of the gospel anyway, don't you think? He was well versed in the Jewish law. He was the Hebrew of Hebrews, he says. He was more zealous than most of his companions were in the faith. And was he not at the day that Stephen was stoned to death after Stephen had presented the gospel to them? Saul was there, was he not? Yes, he was. So he heard the gospel, did he not? Yes, he did. He was an educated man. So in my, in my way of thinking, he knew a lot about the gospel. He just had rejected it. But now Ananias was sent to him to present the gospel to him. And it touched Saul's heart. And for three days, he was there blind. He refused to eat. And he was in prayer with the Heavenly Father. And so after Ananias spoke with them, he allowed him to see again. The miracle of God allowed his, the scales to come off his eyes and Saul could see again. Then Ananias said, Saul, why do you delay? Why are you waiting? Get up and be baptized for the remission of your sins, for the forgiveness of your sins. Brothers and sisters, I don't know you, any of you very well at all, but I do know one thing. That the scripture tells us that we all have sinned and that we all need forgiveness. And if you have not done that, I encourage you to do that today. You have a baptistry here. It can be used very simply. We have clothes that you can change into. But maybe you are a Christian already. You've already been baptized. But you have allowed sin to come into your life. And you would really like to get rid of it. Sometimes it's not easy to, to getting rid of it. Sometimes we need encouragement. We need help. And that's what your family is for right here. We all could pray with you. We can encourage you and uplift you and help you to remove those sins. But then you would ask God, and we would all ask God to forgive you of your sins. And if you are repentant of it, God promises that he will forgive you of those sins. So if we can help you of any way, you have learned the key that will open the door to heaven for you. And that is your obedience to the gospel of Christ. So won't you do that now as we stand and sing, please.
This will be our closing song. There's a message glad for the sinful and the sad. Bring it out. Bring it out. Bring it out. Bring it out. It will give and courage you. It will help it to be true. Bring it out. 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 Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Joe, Joe Kelly as he just brought that wonderful lesson to us and his mission work in the Philippines, Lord. We just thank you so much for that and those baptisms that are now going to be with us, Lord, in heaven. We just ask you to take care of us, guys, protect us. Let us take this lesson to heart and just uh, just bring the message out to everyone we know, Lord. In your son's name we pray. Amen.